Welcome to the, the first non-keynote talk uh, in this room at least, which is by Alex. Alex works at Business Optics and I asked him some, some, something quirky I can say about him for his introduction. He said, well, talk. <laughs> so uh, take it away, Alex. Um, hopefully it'll be something interesting and uh, insightful. Cool, thanks. By the way, I, I have a tendency to mumble, so just like shout if I start to not speak clearly, even if it is loud enough. All right, so hi everyone, I'm Alex. I work at Business Optics and we do solve some cool problems there, but I'm not gonna be talking. Sorry? Oh, that's no, back. I'll just keep this here. Okay, yeah, so this talk is about my own personal projects. Uh, to start with, I'm going to demo a tool called Bird's Eye and then afterwards I'm going to explain some of how it works. So this is the user interface for bird's eye. It's essentially a debugger, and you debug one function call at a time. So this is a single call to the function factorial. And you can see various metadata. Uh, it's not super interesting. We're going to focus on the code. So as you can see, when you hover over any expression here, the value shows at the bottom. So in this case, n is 3. Uh, less than or equal to 1, that's false. n minus 1 is 2, the factorial of which is also 2. And 2 times 3 is 6. I can step into another call to the function. And now n is 2. Stepping in again is what it looks like when n is 1. <coughs> Things have changed now because this bit of code doesn't run, so it's grayed out. So one thing is that you get a very quick view of the statement coverage. The calls to a function get laid out in a nice table so you can see how arguments map to return values or possibly exceptions. And the functions themselves get organized into files. So these are the functions that I'm debugging in this file. One thing that I really love about using bird's eye is that, especially when you're, deep, when you're looking at a very big complicated function that you didn't write and you have no idea what's going on, you can very quickly get a sense of what's happening. And you don't even have to click on anything or type anything. You just hover and scroll and you're already getting a sense. So here I have a loop and I can see how values inside this loop change over time as I step through iterations of the loop. <coughs> now, because it would often be kind of crazy to store all the data from the program, you only actually get a sample of the iterations from the loop, so, so it's not blow up your hard disk or RAM. Um, so yeah, if I step forward again, it'll jump up. But generally, that's not really an issue. Let's take a look at this list here. I can expand data structures and objects to see what's inside. And this becomes especially nice as I step through it. At the moment, it, this value doesn't even exist because this part of the loop didn't happen. So stepping forward, I can see it getting bigger. And yeah, okay. Over here, I have an exception. Now, unlike a typical traceback, you don't just see the line where the exception happened. You can see the exact expression that caused the exception. And this is true even though, even if the exception gets caught, even if it happens multiple times, or sometimes it happens and sometimes it doesn't, so sometimes there's a value, sometimes there isn't. And yeah, those are the main features of bird's eye. Um, so this is the vanilla browser interface. You can use this pretty much regardless of how you run your code or how you write your code. There's a couple of integrations though that make it even more convenient to get to the debugger. So here's the integration for Jupyter Notebooks and Jupyter Lab. When you, you just have to put this 
percent percent i cell magic at the top and it will immediately show the debugger in a pane right below and you still get your output and everything else so if i just change this run bam and okay so that's jupiter you also have an integration with PyCharm. Um, this is a bit suboptimal for projector, but you can also see this online if you want. So what's happening here is that I can edit the code, run the program, and immediately right there, you don't have to leave the editor or anything, your debugging information appears. <coughs> so here's is the start of the animation. And when you run a function, you just click on that I icon on the left and to open up the, the tool window to show what's going on. And if you edit part of the code while you're debugging it, that particular bit of code gets invalidated, but other parts of the code you can continue to, to debug. So yeah, it's very smooth integration. So here we edit x times x, but the result thing is still valid. Cool, so anyway, you get the idea. All right, so that is the demo. Uh, you can store bird's eye easily with pip. It relies on certain internals, so it only works with C Python, but there's no C code involved. There's no messing with the interpreter, and there's no special dependencies. It's all written in Python. The source code is on GitHub, and contributions and feedback are more than welcome. Please. Uh, finding it with Google is easy, so you don't have to memorize the URL or anything. So usage is very simple. In your Python code, just apply this I decorator to the function that you want to trace. And then you can run your program and call that function however you want. Separately, run the bird's eye command in a terminal to start a server, and then you can use the debugger in your browser. Okay, now that we've seen what bird's eye does, we're gonna talk about how it works. So first we're going to look at the AST module. AST stands for Abstract Syntax Tree. It's a module in the standard library, so you don't need to install anything. Quick tip. Uh, when you Google it looking for documentation, skip the standard Python docs, they're not helpful. Go straight to this website, Green Tree Snakes. So to start, pass a string containing Python source code to the pass function, and this returns an AST node. An easy way to see the contents of a node is with the dump function. Here we can see at the high level that the node is a module with two statements, an assignment, and a function call. Going deeper into the tree, we can see more details, like the names of variables, the values of literals, and the fact that we're adding two values together. Traversing through the Python through the tree is easy. You can just access the attributes. That's all there is to passing Python. You probably all know already that you shouldn't pass HTML with regex. Same for Python. Okay. Now, once you have an AST node, you can pass it to the built-in compile function, and this returns a code object. Basically, code objects are the fundamental things that the Python interpreter executes. We'll talk more about details on them later. You can execute the code object yourself by passing it to the exec function, and voila, we ran the code. Two plus two, two plus three is five. Of course, that's not very exciting, could have just passed the original string directly to the exec function and gotten the same result. But we can modify parts of the tree to create different code and execute that instead. So if we change the 2 to a 10 and compile and execute, we now get 10 plus 3, which is 13. Taking it further, the AST module provides helpers for recursively modifying an entire tree. So here I've subclassed the node transformer class and define the method visit num, which is called for every node in the tree with type num, meaning numeric literals. The return value of the method 
then replaces the original node. So I'm changing every number in the code to 100. Then there's some standard boilerplate. I compile that and execute the code. Ta-da! 100 plus 100 is 200. That is the essence of what Birdseye does, but on an insane scale. Every expression is replaced with two function calls. And because of the order in which Python evaluates things, first it calls the before function, then the original expression, and then the after function. Every statement is wrapped in a with block. So that gives four main hooks, before an expression, after an expression, before a statement, and after a statement. And this gives me complete information to track everything that's happening in the program. The most important hook is obviously the after expression function, because it gets the value of the original expression, which it saves for the user, for the user to view later, as you saw. The before expression function is also useful. It notes which expressions are currently being evaluated. Now, evaluating a big expression <coughs> means also evaluating a bunch of smaller sub-expressions. So most of the time, several expressions are currently being evaluated. The before function pushes expressions onto a stack, and the after function pops them off. Then if an exception happens, it will be caught by the with block, yeah, wrapping that statement, and whatever expression is on top of the stack must have been what caused the exception. And then the user interface can highlight that particular expression in red, as you saw. As you can imagine, all this slows things down a lot at runtime. So to reduce this impact on performance, the user doesn't transform the entire file, but rather just one function at a time with the eye decorator, as you saw. So let's look at how that happens. Here's a Python file. I want to transform the dunder init method and nothing else. First, we use the inspect module to get the source code of the function. I if you've never seen the inspect module, you should absolutely check it out. It is the essential module for doing cool tricks in Python. Then, we go through the usual motions of passing compiling and executing. And you can imagine that we'd also make some modifications to the AST, but we're not actually going to bother with that here. Now, that line exec source has executed the function definition in the global scope. So we can access it directly by the name init and assign it back to the class to replace the original method. Then we can test it by constructing the class to call the method. And guess what? It doesn't work. See, in Python 3, you can use the super function without any arguments because of some special magic. When the compiler sees super being used inside a class, it inserts a hidden reference to the class. And that's the class cell. Yeah, that's the class cell. I mentioned in there a message. So because we compiled the init function in isolation outside a class, that didn't happen. <coughs> if you're lost, don't worry. The general lesson is that when compiling code, context matters. A couple of other examples of important context. Functions defined locally in other functions need to know about the outer function. And future imports, like from future import print function, change the syntax tree. So what Birdseye does to solve this problem is a bit of a sledgehammer against a nut. It, compi it compiles the entire file and extracts only the code object it needs. OK, let's take a bit of a closer look at code objects. They have loads of attributes, most of which are for the interpreter, and you never need to care about them. If you look at the doc string, you'll actually see a warning that creating one directly is not for the faint of heart. Fortunately, you should never have to. Uh, you either create them with the compile function, as we've been doing, or you'll find them attached to various objects. There's a code object for each block of code that Python executes in its own scope. That includes modules, class definitions, and most importantly, functions. There's a few attributes I'd like to highlight, which we'll use now. There's the constants, 
the name of the code, which is usually the name of the associated function or class, and the line number where the source code starts. So let's see how we use these. Like before, here's a Python var, and we want to focus on the init method. The function object has a code object attached. We're interested in the name and line number because they identify the code object uniquely, and we're going to be looking for those values later. So we go through some boilerplate, as usual, to read the file, pass it, modify the tree, and compile it. Now we have a code object associated with the module. Remember, this is for the entire file, and we're looking for a code object inside it associated with the modified function. The constants attribute of the module code object is a tuple of all the constant values that the code uses during execution. We can see the value 2, which gets assigned to y, the class name a, and of course the code object, most importantly, which executes the class definition. That's the class definition, not in it just yet. Looking at the code, looking at the constants of that code object, we can see something similar, including the code object for the init method that we're looking for. And we can know that it's the right code object by looking at the name and the line number attributes and verifying that they match the values for the original code object attached to the original init method. Once we have the right code object, we can use it to directly construct a new function. The constructor takes a few other arguments, but we can just copy them from the original function that we're replacing. And that's it. That is what the I decorator does. Right. That was part one of the talk. Before we move on, we can take some time for questions, if that's OK, um, while it's fresh in people's minds. Do we have any questions from the audience on this first part? On um, that side. Yes, over there. Bring the microphone. Hey. Uh, Thanks. That looks really cool. Um, I have a question about uh, multi-threaded code and multi-process code. How does it cope with it? Uh, as long as your function is properly defined, does it just work? Yeah, so, I mean, we've already kind of seen how it has to deal with this just with the factorial function, which was recursively calling itself, and so it's having to keep track of the state of the different things. But yes, it'll, it'll extend as well for threads and so on. Basically, um, so it, you remember it, it's storing state for each function call, and each function call is associated with a frame. We're going to talk about frames just now. So the frames are used as keys in a dictionary to keep track of the different bits of state. Okay, thanks. Is there another question? Okay, well, perhaps we'll, All uh, right. just, well, if you think of any more, you'll have another chance at the end of the talk. Yeah. Okay, now we're going to talk about a different library called Sorcery. Uh, this library is basically some silly fun. You're about to see some serious dark magic that you probably shouldn't use in a production environment. <laughs> All of it can be imported from Sorcery. So, here's a pattern you often have to write. It's tedious and repetitive. Wouldn't it be great if you could somehow get variable names as strings to use in your code? Something like this. Here, assign names is a tuple containing the names of the variables being assigned to. Here's another example. Instead of having to declare each value of an enum on a separate line and giving it some value, you can just write this. So what's going on here? Assigned names is a spell which is a special kind of callable that knows the context in which it's called. It has access to the AST node where the call happens. Here's a couple more examples along similar lines. Python has tuple unpacking. Why not dictionary unpacking? Other languages have it. Or very similarly, you can unpack attributes. Here's another common annoying pattern. 
specifying dictionary keys that are the same as your variable name. So the spell dict off fills in those keys for you. One more spell, and then we'll talk about how this works. Maybe is a spell that takes one argument. If that argument is not none, it just returns that argument, and that's it. If the argument is none, then any sequence of the operations attribute access, square bracket access, and function calls immediately to the right of the maybe will essentially be ignored, and the final result will be none. So all the intermediate operations will return some special object, and the final one will just magically return none. Basically, it's a concise way to not have to check for none manually. Uh, it's similar to using the Elvis operator in some other languages like Groovy. There's actually a PEP for this, PEP 505 non-aware operators that would bring an operator to do something like this, but well, more like the Elvis operator, but until that's here, you can use this. So, to explain how this all works, we first have to talk about the concept of frames. So consider this simple script. At the bottom, we call foo, which calls bar, which raises an exception. And that gives us a traceback. This tells us the state of the program when the exception happened. And that state, at all times, is stored in the stack, which consists of frames. Each of these sections here corresponds to one stack frame. A frame is a temporary structure which holds the current state of one execution of a code object, which typically means a function call. We can see that some of the data, well, we can see some of that data from the frames and codes in the traceback. A frame holds a reference to the code object it's executing. And it's from the code object that we get the file name at the beginning and <coughs> the name of the function. The frame itself also has the line number of the source code that's currently being executed, which of course is constantly changing. So here's how we can interact with frames in code. In the bar function, we call inspect.currentFrame, which returns the frame for the execution of bar. So that's for this call. And the frame has an fback attribute, which points to the parent frame one level up in the stack, meaning the frame that called this one. <coughs> so here the variable previous is the frame for foo. Here are some of the attributes of that previous frame. There's a dictionary of the local variables, x and y. There's the code object and the line number that is currently being executed which of course here is the line where the function bar is called. That's line four. So using all this information, I can retrieve the source code where bar has been called from. The code object tells me the file name, and the frame has the line number in that file. I can extract the line as a string and pass it into an AST. Somewhere in that tree, I can find a node corresponding to the call to bar. Now, this won't work in all cases, because a function call can span many lines. So sorcery does something a little bit more, bit more complicated. But this fits nicely in a slide. You get the gist. I have the information to do this. I also don't necessarily have to look for the name of the function bar in the source code. Since I have access to the frame's local variables, I can search for variables where the value is the function. So in this case, bar has been assigned to the variable y. So calls with the name y in the AST also work. So Suite takes care of all the stuff for you. All you do is apply the decorator spell to a function. And when the spell is called, <laughs> the first argument the function will receive will be an object called a frame info. And the main thing the frame info provides is the call node. So here, bar knows it was called with variables named x and y.
is an example of a spell. This is a minimal implementation of the dict of spell we saw earlier. It doesn't have all the features, but it has the basics. We simply pair up the AST nodes representing the arguments with the argument values. Here, arg.id is the name of a variable. OK, that's it for sorcery. I'm going to quickly show you another way you can do some cool Python introspection, and then that's the end. This doesn't require any libraries. You simply define a function with a certain signature and pass it to the function sys.setTrace. Then your function will be called constantly as the program runs. If you want, it'll be called every time a line of code is executed. This is the underlying mechanism for most debuggers like PDB or the PyCharm debugger. Here's a simple example. This trace function will work every time a function is called. It prints the name of the function with some indentation based on how deep the function call is. Here's an example program to demonstrate. Uh, main calls foo three times and foo calls bar. And here's what the output of the trace function looks like. Now you have a quick overview of how the program runs. That's the end of the talk. Um, if you find this kind of thing interesting, consider coming to the open space I'm hosting later today. It's very open-ended and a bit hard to describe. The things I've shown today are good examples of what I'd like to hear about, but they're also quite extreme, and I'd be happy to discuss much simpler ideas. And they also they don't have to be related to frames or the AST or anything like that. There's lots of other cool things you can do with Python, cool tricks that I'd, I'd like to see, which you have in mind. What I don't want to hear about is anything that a non-programmer would find interesting. <laughs> so I don't want to hear how you served millions of customers and made a bunch of money. <laughs> also, feel free to show either things you've created or just discuss things that you want to be created by yourself or someone else. Even just features you wish Python had. Maybe a spell you'd like to be added to sorcery or something random. I have a little bit of bonus time. I'm just going to quickly mention something else that I think is cool. Okay. This, this spell unpack atters. Um, sorry, unpack keys. You also use tuple unpacking typically in a loop, so something like. something like this. And you might expect that this isn't going to really do what you want. But it will, because we're using magic. And so the thing knows the context in which it's being called from. Uh, you can mention more dictionaries with the same structure in that list. So in this case, unpack keys isn't going to do the same kind of thing it does here. It's going to see I'm in a for loop, and it'll return an iterable of tuples rather than just one tuple. And so then the unpacking would work as you imagine. You don't have to remember which function to call or anything. OK, that's it. That's all the bonus stuff I have. Right. Thanks very much, Alex. Uh, before we take questions, to let you know that it'll be we'll be starting five minutes late for the next session because we started a bit late here. So I think that's five past eleven will be the next session. Uh, do we have a runner available to bring the microphone around to people? Otherwise, I'll do it. Okay. Ah, oh, there's Tafik. Thank you. Right. So who has a question? Okay. So Mary over there. Um, so I'm assuming the frame data structure that's a linked list, right? Is that is yes. it any? What's the data structure for the frames that you're working with? Is it a linked list? 
Oh, you mean how do I store all the frames together? Well, I mean, yeah, um, like it's it's just a dictionary from with frames as the keys, and I call it it's in, in bird's eye. It's also called a frame in for no particular reason, and it's got various metadata I want, like that expression stack mm -hmm. and the values of the expressions. Mm -hmm. I, I I don't store the frames in a special structure like a stack mm -hmm. because. Well, for one thing, there's the issue of different threads. Yeah. So there's multiple stacks. Um, but also, the, s the, the stack in Python isn't as static as you might think. It's not always just things popping and pushing yeah. straightforwardly, especially when you have a generator, for example, mm. and you go back and forth between the generator and the thing that's iterating over the generator. Mm. So it's just a dictionary. I, I did start with an actual stack at one point, and I realized that wasn't working. Yeah, that made sense because um, I was going to ask, I thought it was a linked list and I was just like, you're just going to have to like traverse it linearly. That would not be very efficient for certain stuff. Cool, thank yeah, you. So each time the one of those hook functions runs, like the four expression or whatever, it quickly retrieves the frame <laughs> like you saw for sorcery mm. and then it uses that to look up the information about this core uh -huh. and attach things and so on. Cool. Um, also, what Hogwarts house is sorcery sorted in? <laughs> I guess Ravenclaw? Uh, interesting. Maybe Slytherin? <laughs> Forbidden section of the library? Yeah. Uh, since generators were mentioned now, uh, is there some special way to preview what's inside a generator using bird eye? Bird's eye? I mean, it's essentially, it's still just another function call. Um, so. It's not going to look different. You'll still see a loop with the values, and you can step through that loop. Um, but there's no like link between the generator and whatever's iterating for it, or rather, well, several things could be iterating over it. So you wouldn't have that. So yeah, it's it's straightforward and the same as everything else. If you have a complicated program that doesn't actually terminate and you want to inspect one of these functions um, that occurs like halfway through some sort of processing. Yeah, no, unfortunately at the moment um, it just collects all the data and dumps it once at the end of the function call. So right now you can't view things live. But that could be added. You want to do that? Yeah, that would be great. <laughs> it would be great if you do that. <laughs> <laughs> Can, can you use this for like twisted? What happens if you inspect twisted reactor loops with like? I don't know about it? twisted. Uh, in general, you can't use it for things that use the new async stuff. Oh. Um, as you can imagine, like the way things move around, it gets unpredictable. So, mm. yeah, the sort of exotic stuff, maybe G events and so on, probably wouldn't work very well either. Oh. Okay. But. If you don't have weird thread stuff going on, I think that you can use it in pretty much any program. Cool. <laughs> yeah, actually, I just want to come back to my question. So if I did actually um, run a program where I uh, you know, like inspected one function call, would it then only you know, like dump the results like at the end of that function call once? Or if it then gets called again, would it then, you know, like what will actually happen if you if you ran this, oh, what will actually happen if you run um, this, you know, this program and try to figure out what happened in a function, but the program doesn't actually terminate and it carries on? Can you then look on your web page and see what happened? You know, just the first time it encountered that function. Uh, so the f factorial example was, was an example of that. You saw there was a bunch of calls. That was all from a single run of the program. Um, and it's, it's dumping the data immediately as the function call ends. So if you're running a web server, you don't have to terminate the web server to see the output. Um, you just have to have the function call itself terminating, either with an exception or just returning. And if, if that happened multiple times, would it yeah, just the capture the first no, 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 it'll, it'll just be adding them to the list of calls. So you, know, you, you, you hit your browser endpoint to trigger the function, and then you can go to bird's eye, and you'll see the new call there.
since it's a sequence of basically three people asking the questions, I thought I should, I'm obligated to ask another. Um, is there a way to dynamically turn the inspection on and off without editing the code? So I can maybe specify an argument on a method um, or maybe write my own wrapper that turns this on and off. Um, so tying in with his question about uh, debugging some code in production. Say I make a call to my web server with some, some special argument that only I know about and I ask it to go and dump these inspection details so that I can investigate them more thoroughly. Yeah. Would I be able to do that? Y you could certainly write like a wrapper to the function which holds two copies of the function, one which has been decorated and one which hasn't, and then decides which one to call. Um, there's nothing built in to do that at the moment, but it should be pretty easy. That's a lot of time. Uh, so with the sorcery, you know, it obviously depends on looking at what variable name you pass as an argument. What's going to happen if you pass an expression instead of a variable name? Okay, so it's not, explode? it's not just uh, variable names that it'll recognize. Um, me, that's not worth it. Um, but when you pass something and it, it wants to find the name of that thing, like this foo, um, that can or this foo rather, that can either be just a plain variable, it can be some expression that, ha that is then like accessed with square brackets with a string literal key, or an attribute. So actually I can go at this then. So these would also work. Um, and then if you pass it, something else, whatever, you'll get an, a, an exception saying, hey, I don't know what the name of this thing is. Okay. And the same thing works when you're looking at these other spells that look at the names that are being assigned to. Again, this could be well, that. No, that won't give an exception. That, that's actually not where it's interesting. It's rather here. That will correctly figure out that you want foo. So it'll use the, the, context of, the contents of the string literal as the name of that expression being assigned to. OK, as Adriana said, we do actually have a bit more time. Any other questions? Uh, yes, one here. Hello. Hi. This is probably more of a general question. Um, how would frames interact with a lambda expressions and things like that? Lambdas are just functions, really. Um, so a lambda gets a frame when you call it. A lambda has its own code object. Um, the only thing is that you can't trace lambdas in bird's eye at the moment because there's a few things that have to change, like there's no initial statement which bird's eye looks for. It goes straight into an expression. And critically, you can define several lambdas on one line, and then when bird's eye tries to track down the code that you've modified, it won't be able to because it will be ambiguous. Hello again. Um, can you do aggregations across calls to the function? Um, so what I'm thinking about is like something that could show me maybe in a function across 100 invocations, could I see the hotspots of like your if conditionals? You know, how many times did you go on one branch versus a different branch? No. No, you view data for one call at a time. Um, but there's no reason you couldn't write. Some, something could be written for that. Mm. If you have a use case, open an issue. <laughs> cool. <laughs> well, I'm 
assuming that the coverage package actually already does something like that. Mm. Uh, any more questions? Otherwise, we can have tea. Tea is looking popular. Okay, so the announcement about changes to the schedule. Let me just get it up here. Um, okay, so tea runs until 11.35, so that's be half an hour for us. Then lunch starts at 105, so that's again five minutes late, and then lunch ends 145 as originally scheduled. And that'll get us back on track. Okay, uh, should we give our speaker a round of applause?